last week. All right, well, we're running a little behind, so I'm going to jump right into it. Uh, thank you for coming to uh, our panel on all ages graphic noveling. I'm not sure that's noveling. What is that? Is well, anyway. Um, so my name is Heidi McDonald. I am the editor in chief of the Beat at ComicsBeat.com. Um, so we're here to talk with three amazing cartoonists. As always, I'm so lucky. I get to do nothing but travel the world talking to amazing cartoonists. <laughs> so um, today we have Jeffrey Brown, the author of Jedi Academy and Good Night Vader, and uh, which I probably mangled the title of and. Yeah. yeah, Darth Vader and Son. Darth Vader and Son. Lucy yeah. and Andy Neanderthal. Yes. yes. the new series. There we go. And yes, Lucy and Andy uh, Neanderthals. And um, of course, many wonderful children's books. And uh, next to him, we have Rebecca Mock, who is just, um, your book has just come out. Uh, Compass South, which is a pirate tale uh, adventure, uh, some, some uh, kidnapping, some high seas, some skullduggery. Um, I, I, uh, I just did the art for it yes. as well. Yes, and uh, Joy that's, Hope Larson. Yeah, uh, well, we definitely team, want to talk about it. about collaboration because that's really a big part of these um, books. And then finally, we have Faith Aaron Hicks, um, whose book *The Nameless City* came out, and you also are the author of many other books for uh, different age groups, but um, many all ages. So, everyone, uh, thank you. Please help me in welcoming our panelists. So um, I'm going to show a couple of things. So we'll talk really quickly just about a little bit about uh, some of your work, and then we can talk, maybe go back and do some you know, general questions about writing for all ages and, um, and of course, questions from the audience. But um, so Faith, with, uh, with The Nameless City is uh, for first second, and uh, is it a middle grade? It's middle grade, yeah, right? Yeah, it's middle grade, and yeah. uh, it's a trilogy. So this is the first of three books. Yeah. So. So you all work in trilogies, right, actually? <laughs> oh, I wish. This is only a duology, Two right? Books. <laughs> okay. Um, but before that, you had done, I think the first book of yours I saw was Zombies Call, Zombies Calling. Calling, yeah. yeah. That was, oh my goodness, that book was published in 2007. Yeah, well, from, you're a veteran now, so. Yeah, from SLG Publishing. Right, so. but that was more not all ages, right? No, no, that was, I guess, like, I don't know, like, I was, I was pretty recently out of college, and I had lots of, like, very strong and angry opinions about, like, college debt. Um, and I decided to basically do a, a zombie comic about my feelings about my student loans. Um, so it was probably a, aimed at like angry 21-year-olds <laughs> like me. I feel like that book has a timeless theme that would uh, stand up for the present. Um, you know, then you you did. Um, Boy, I'm just, uh, it's at the end of the con, end of the con. Last panel of the day, but you know, then you did some uh, your first book for first second, which yeah. was uh, the title, which I um, so I, I drew right. a, a book that was written by uh, two other authors, Susan Kim and Lawrence Clavin. That was uh, I think it was I think it was like middle grade horror. It was yes. called Brain Camp. It was yes. it is like the grossest book. <laughs> it has such book. gross things in it. Um, I don't know. It's and it's like it's a horror book, and it, but it's also like all the horror is like a metaphor for puberty. So it's one of those books. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah. <laughs> so was that the first book that you'd done that was more all ages, though? I, I mean, I, I I would not give that book to a small child. So I don't consider <laughs> it, it all ages. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it was the first book that I'd done. No, 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 because I also did um, I did a book called The War at Ellesmere, which was basically about like. Um, girls at boarding school and at an all girls boarding school and friendships and competitions and rivalries and that kind of thing. And that was published by SLG. Um, you know, the, SLG was an indie publisher and it's like, you put these books out and you're lucky if you sell like a thousand copies. So uh, I don't feel like, you know, many people have an awareness of my work before right. for a second. Um, but that book was definitely like, I, I wrote it and drew it for me as an 11 year old, basically my dream book for me at that age. Yeah. Well, how did, I mean, like, uh, is The Nameless City also a dream book for you? I mean, oh, yes. Like, yeah. Oh, my goodness, yes. <laughs> <laughs> the Nameless City, yeah, so, uh, sorry, that's a patron brain camp. Oh, my God, get rid of it. <laughs> okay, so this is The Nameless City, and um, yes, this book, 
Um, it, this trilogy, it has basically everything that I love in it. Um, it's a middle grade action and adventure, and it has um, a very sweet, thoughtful boy character and a very tough, um, also emotional and thoughtful girl character. And um, it has everything that I wanted to see in a graphic novel trilogy. So um, this relationship between this, this boy and girl, and then also they are on opposite sides of a political conflict. Um, they live in a very complicated world where um, the boy, his name is Kai, his, um, his people are in control, his, his, the nation that he belongs to is in control or occupying this particular city that the girl, Rat, um, lives in. So they are involved in a very complicated political situation and potentially would hate each other. And anyway, I'm babbling. But yeah, this book has everything that I wanted to draw in it. Right, I, I was going to say, though, I, I mean, it, it, so it is. Much. Thank you. It is a, um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of complex backstory in it and, you know, sophisticated themes and, and um, I, I mean, I guess uh, uh, what I want to get to a little bit is just about your evolution from, you know, Zombies Calling is definitely like guts get ripped out, whatever, at will and, you know, uh, you know, now, I mean, is, is, is there more stri restrictions when doing all ages comics? I mean, how have you evolved? To I mean... I definitely feel like there are issues and themes and then also issues like, um, say, swearing that I, I need to be very aware of. And also that that kind of comes with working with a publisher like For a Second, who is a book publisher, um, not that they have ever restricted me in any kind of content. Um, Nameless City does have moments that are quite violent, and um, I wanted to deal with issues of violence and not sugarcoat those issues. And to their credit, they have been very supportive of this. Um, so far, I haven't received any complaints. Um, over the, the violence in the book. Um, but yeah, I mean, when I made this book, it was like I wanted to make it for kids and not talk down to kids. Because I think kids are smart, and I think that they're very willing to read about complex situations and issues like oppression and racism and conquer, being conquered and um, conquering. And yeah, that was, that was my book. <laughs> Yeah, that's a page from Brain, no, that's not Brain Camp. Uh, that's Friends with Boys. That was, uh, I guess it's a teen book. Um, it skews a little young for a teen book, but um, that was slightly autobiographical. It's about a homeschooled girl going into public high school for the very first time, and she has three brothers. Uh, and she's also haunted by a ghost. Uh, <laughs> I was homeschooled until high school, and I also have three brothers, but I've never seen a ghost. <laughs> well, um, of which, now, you, you have done a couple books that were, like, this was probably your most autobiographical, but it wasn't an autobiographical. No, story. no, it's, yeah. I mean, I consider it to be emotionally true, but, um, none, oh, I mean, there's a couple of scenes in the book that were directly lifted from, from my teenage years, but um, the story itself is not right. accurate to real life. Do you prefer to do things that are more, like, fantasy than real life, or is it equal, just whatever comes your way? Um... I, I mean, with Nameless City, that was the first book that I did that was, that was fantasy. It's set in a fictional world, um, a world a little bit based on my interest in uh, Chinese history, in particular China in the 13th century. Um, with Friends with Boys, like, I, I do like realistic YA, but it always has to have like, a, a goofy little twist to it. So there's a ghost for <laughs> no, I mean, there's like metaphorical reasons, but there's like no real reason why there's a ghost in there. Um, so yeah. And that was from Brain Camp. I like all genres. I want to do it all. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jeffrey, let's talk a little bit. Uh, your new book is out, right? It came yep. out last week? Yeah. Wow, brand new. Uh, and and Thank you, you. I want you to say it for with the title of the book. Lucy and Andy Neanderthal. So it's Neanderthals, just yes. so you know, guys. All right. Mm -hmm. um, now, of course, this is your first uh, all original book that you made up, and here's some adorable <laughs> Jeffrey Brown. If you're familiar with Jeffrey's work at all, you're going to, they hunted the woolly mammoth and everything. But uh, before that, you were fooling around in the Star Wars yeah. universe, right? <laughs> Lots of Star Wars. Now, it, as a, I did not put any of your earliest work on this slideshow, <laughs> for fear there would be children in the room. <laughs> but you did start out with very adult material. Yeah, yeah. I started out with with autobiographical stories about failed relationships, um, and yeah, not for kids. Okay. So, <laughs> but now you're a kids author. Well, no, I'm, I'm an <laughs> author <laughs> <laughs> that makes books that right. kids like <laughs> and, and adults. Oh, okay. Well, that's that's very. Um, 
Um, I mean, is, was there, yeah. same question as I asked Faith, though. I mean, was there an evolution for you and how you learned um, what was? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's all been pretty organic. I mean, so I think the transition started with Darth Vader and Son, which I was writing intending it for adults, um, thinking, you know, like, here's a, here's a cute Star Wars book that kind of deals with parenting. So all, all these people like me who grew up with Star Wars and are now having kids, um, they'll relate to this. But then kids really liked it too, m maybe even more than the adults. And so, um, and it was because of Darth Vader and Son that I got to do Jedi Academy. My, my editor at Lucasfilm recommended me to Scholastic. And so it, was, it wasn't, wasn't a planned transition. It wasn't like I set out to do it, but um, I just kind of like, this seems fun, so I'll, I'll do this next. Mm -hmm. Now, would, would have there been, um, I mean, have there been, you know, stories or ideas that, that you tried to do that weren't appropriate, you know, like? <laughs> no, no, Jeffrey, um, no. <laughs> well, you know, Han and Leia. We could all make I mean, was, Yeah, but, I mean, well, you know, there's, there's stuff, but I kind of knew, I, I usually kind of know what they're going to say no to, you know? Mm -hmm. So, like, like there's one, one joke in one of the Vader books where, where Vader sees Princess Leia and Han Solo kissing, and he's like, no! <laughs> and then I was like, but the, the other joke to make there is, you know, it's like Luke and Leia kissing. <laughs> it's like, they're not going to go for that. Um, but I drew it anyway, because, you know, in my little sketchbook, like, just right. in case you guys want to do this, I can do this one, too. Um, that one didn't make the cut to the next round. Um, yeah, so usually I, I kind of suff at it before. Well, let's but. talk, I mean, let's talk about um, Andy and Lucy. I mean, uh, I know I talked to you, you've done six Star Wars books, and probably seven. over seven? <laughs> oh, right, seven, years, right, yeah. over in four years? Okay, so that was a pretty strong indoctrination. And I think I saw you a couple years ago, and you were like, I'm not doing any more Star Wars books. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I kind of am, but yeah. not ah! any more full. Not as involved. Right. Not nearly as involved. Well, t tell us about yeah. Lucy and Andy. How did that work? Yeah. So out? I mean, I knew I knew I was going to need a break, and and Jedi Academy. I had always envisioned like the character stories. I kind of had it planned for three books, and I kind of knew even at the first book that I wouldn't be. It wasn't something that I was like was going to mentally be able to do. You know, eight to ten books for years and years. And so uh, I was thinking about, well, what am I going to do after Jedi Academy? And I don't really have any, I'm married with two kids, so I don't really have any failed relationships to write about right now. Um, fingers crossed. <laughs> uh, and then, uh, so I was thinking about what I would do next, and Lucy Andy was an idea to actually come up with as a, a pitch for a cartoon. and back in like 2010 and it just nothing it never went anywhere it was much it was a little different too um so i thought oh that's something i could i could take out of the cupboard and dust off and so i kind of reworked it and and i, I um the basic idea was just doing doing a fun caveman story for kids that was grounded in in the research and science which starting starting back in like two, around 2010 is when there seemed to be like this exponential increase of new discoveries about um, Neanderthals and early humans. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, as you could see, I mean, that's, it is based on, uh, it is sort of cute little adventures, but then you have a little science aspect to it, right? Yeah, yeah, there's like, and I made it, so it's two paleontologist characters, so they, they're kind of jokey and they'll come in and explain the science, but it, like there's, it's not super heavy. Mm. Now, have you? This has only been out for a week, right? So, yep. you have you had kids talk, you know, telling you you were wrong yet, or <laughs> not, not yet? <laughs> no, I, they're still they're still they're still finishing telling me what's wrong with my Star Wars stuff. <laughs> so, they haven't gotten to telling me about these yet. Right. Well, you know they are going to fact check you. Yeah, they will. Yeah. So, um, 
uh, just, uh, I love that, by the way. Um, what was it? Um, Attack of the Bully. Attack of the, what was the Star Wars the, Jenny Academy book? Attack the Phantom the, Bully. The Phantom yeah. Bully. Yeah, <laughs> I guess that was, uh, could have been the, the real thing. Um, well, there's a page from, uh, I messed up. There we go. Compass South. <laughs> so, Rebecca, you are, uh, you're not, you're the illustrator. You are not the writer. Right? I'm the illustrator. Yes, yes. Or the, the artist. Yes, the artist. I have, there we go. I wanted to show oh, one wow. of your famous GIFs that you, or GIFs. GIFs. I, GIFs that you do <laughs> also. Yes, I've never hey. until this moment GIF. known that it was GIF. I'm a, uh, GIF is a peanut butter. Yes, I know. I know. <laughs> well, there we go. We've learned a lot of this. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, you do illustration on uh, these, which are mind-boggling, um, and uh, how did you get into uh, drawing Compass South? How did you do that? Um, Compass South was a project that Hope Larson was already developing um, in around 2012, end of 2012, and she put out a call on Twitter for artists to potentially collaborate with, and I sent her basically um, a reel of all the comics I had done in college, which it was a while ago at that point. And she emailed me back and said, I'd love you to do a test. And it sort of like snowballed from there. But basically, she sort of like mentored me through a lot of it. Oh, OK. Now, had you drawn a long form comic before no. at that point? Yeah, I, that's, uh, that's what I thought. Because you went to SVA, correct? No, I went to MICA. Oh, OK. Sorry. <laughs> See, I'm Micah learning so in much in this panel. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, but but did you go to draw comics, or did you go to be an illustrator, or both, uh, or? Yeah, I went to draw comics, um, but that didn't work out right out of graduating college, so I was doing um, odd jobs and a little bit of freelance at that point. Um, so this, and like I was trying to motivate myself to draw my own comics, but I had no ideas of my own, like stories, and so it ended up being like the perfect collaboration, because I felt like I, I'm the type of person who gets really involved in other people's stories. Mm. I'm a, I'm a fangirl, and so this was the perf. And I'm a big fan of Hope's, so I got to basically be a fangirl of hers for a little right. while. Well, it's I mean it's beautiful, uh, beautifully drawn. I mean, could you what's uh, a, could you tell that, us? That is uh, not from oh. Compass South. Well, that is from what is that from though? Uh, it's, which is drawn Oh, yes, by you're right, because it says spare at the top. This is, oh, that one's drawn by me, yes. Yes, there you go. Sorry about that. I no, apologize. <laughs> I did put this together. That is uh, from Sparrow, though, okay. yes. There we go. Uh, all right, so, but this is you. You do yeah, that. This yeah. is one of the only, this, no, this is literally the only comic I had drawn that had been published before Compass South, right. which was like a 12 page short comic at the end of Sparrow Volume 3. Right. Uh, okay, well, we'll get to something. Nope, I, oh I my couldn't God. find. You know what? I couldn't find. Any the interior pages from I'm the book. I'm so sorry. No, I, it's I okay. Would... Because, well, it's my own fault for not, not you know, emailing Rebecca and saying, send me some artwork. Now we'll have to go buy it. I know. <laughs> well, trust me. I really that. recommend it. It, it is. is. It is. Well, tell us about what it's, what it's about. Tell us about um, the story. Compass South is about uh, a pair of twins, um, Alex and Cleo, who are living in 1860s New York. And they get into a bit of trouble. Their father disappears, um, so they're orphans on the street. They join a street gang and become the thieves, and they get caught by the police. And so in order to escape uh, the wrath of their gang leader and also the police, they run away to New Orleans and hop on a ship and get involved in pirates, uh, with pirates, and uh, realize that they might be the uh, heirs to a, um, a great treasure which is sort of tied into like why their father disappeared and like you know, it's, oh, it's a all, frothy it's a bit brood. of a mystery. It's a frothy brood. With a lot of like a sailing and um, sea shanties thrown in. <laughs> <laughs> well, isn't that every kid's dream though to run and jump, just jump. You know what, I'm chucking this and I'm jumping on a pirate ship. <laughs> it's my dream, <laughs> my dream now. Did you, um, did you do a lot of research? I mean, do you like doing historical research? I, I had never been involved in this kind of project before, but I found that I did really love it. Hope, and also Hope had already done a lot of research, so she sent me, she would mail me these like vintage books and these uh, research books and just like heavy tomes just full of like things I had no idea about. I didn't know how to draw a ship. Um, so it was uh, this wonderful process of both of us learning. Wow. Now, do you, so, so this is, as we said, it's the first, right? And mm -hmm, the, the sequel's coming out next year? Next summer. What, and what's it called? Knife's Edge. Knife's Edge, right. So we learn this more. This adventure continues. Yes, yes. Um, do you feel after doing this book that you um, want to continue to be an illustrator? 
like in this way or do you ah. want to tell your own stories in, or? You, as in rather yeah. than tell my own write yeah. and draw I guess I would be happy continuing with just being an, uh, the artist or illustrator working with other writers I suppose I do write my own comics and self-publish but they're all very short comics um, and I've also tried to start getting involved with friends and having them write stories for me so that I can just draw something that I haven't written because it's almost it's cathartic to just sort of take a story that's already been formed and take it apart and put it back together as a comic. Hmm. Um, I find it a very uh, challenging and rewarding process. Wow. Well, I think you're going to have a lot of writers lining up to work with you. <laughs> 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 because your art is awesome. <laughs> um, well, let me throw, now that you know we, we can uh, see a little bit of what you all do, let me throw it open. Because uh, I mean, in talking about what's appropriate for children, though, in general, you know, I mean, Jeffrey, you're a father yourself, and, um, you know, there's so much talk now uh, about, you know, what kids should or shouldn't see. But, I mean, now there's a lot more concern also just about, you know, themes of, you know, cultural appropriation and, you know, and, and that way. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, do you worry about what you're going to put into your stories the, for the impressionable youth? Um, I don't know what I would say worry. Um, I mean, I, I think kids are smarter than they get credit for sometimes. And I think there's this, uh, I don't know, there's a little bit of a sense of like overprotection these days that like I never had when I was a kid. And I remember I, I kind of self-edited in my selection of things a lot. And I know, I know my son Oscar for sure does. Um, because it took him forever before he watched Return of the Jedi. And I was like, when are you going to watch Return of the Jedi? He's like, Dad, I'm not, I'm not ready yet. <laughs> and I was like, this is insane. I, I had seen it uh, like 50 times by your age. But, um, no, but I mean, I think, I think, so I think, you know, I think if you're, if you're a parent who is kind of in tune with, with what, your, what your kid's interests are and you kind of know your kid, um, and you're attentive, they, they'll repay that respect and they kind, of, they kind of know what's right for them and what's not. And there, there might be a little curiosity of, oh, that's the kind of the forbidden fruit. But I think if you're, you know, for, for the most part, um, I think, like I just like to write kind of what I would like to see. And um, in terms of making it right for kids, it's a lot of times just, you know, changing the language, simplifying, you know, leaving out certain words. Um, sometimes, like concepts that are a little heavy, I might tone back. So, like mm -hmm. dealing with with death or something like that, um, you just handle a little differently. But um, yeah. How about you guys? Um, uh, well, to to look at the question in a slightly different way, I think that there are. Narratives that uh, are themes in some of our older fiction, or uh, like the, the stuff we grew up on, that we can be more mindful about editing out, like sexist stories or racist stories. Um, stories that, th these are things that teach children about how our world work, uh, works, and we, can, we have the power to sort of change how they think about themselves in relation to other people. And I think that's something that it's very uh, important that we, we sort of edit ourselves and say, actually, I'm only putting this character in or only showing them this way because that's how I would, I imagine it because of all the stories I've read. But isn't this sexist? Isn't this sort of offensive? Um, isn't there like a different way that the world actually works? Yeah. So. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a great point. Like, I, I feel like a lot of my career is like, trying to tell the kind of stories that I wanted to read when I was 11. And, you know, I know, like, I was a huge tomboy as a kid, and I, don't, I typically gravitated towards and, and identified with male characters because, you know, they were the ones that got to go on adventures and be heroic and be the leaders and that kind of thing. And I wanted to see women and girls in those roles. And, you know, not, not to say that my stories have no men in, in, in them that aren't, you know, awesome. Like, I like writing awesome boys, but um, I also wanted the girls to be included, and that was definitely where I was coming from with Nameless City, where I wanted an action and adventure story with 
male and female her heroes that were equal, you know, and had their own strengths, and maybe their strengths were not necessarily stereotypical of their gender. Um, that was important to me. This seems very basic, you know, and and I feel like I feel like you know there's a lot more of a, a nuanced discussion happening, um, you know, with these issues. Um, so I feel like I'm addressing it in a very basic way. But yeah, like I I I don't know. I absolutely make the kind of books that I wanted to read as a kid, as someone who was super into Star Trek and Star Wars and <laughs> Indiana Jones, and it was like. <laughs> well, there was Princess Leia, and and she is great. Don't get me wrong, she is great. But there's not many girls otherwise. Yeah. Yeah. There's not. There's only one girl in my book too. <laughs> but she's awesome. There's only yeah. One. Like that's <laughs> like that's fine, right? As yeah. long as there's there's one. But I, and all three of your books are about a, a boy and a girl. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. So was this a trend? Did your editors come to you and say, it "Better be a boy and a girl"? <laughs> no. No, I mean, I wanted yeah. to do one, a book yeah. about a boy My and a girl, because I, I did, I actually did, um, so when I did The Word Ellesmere, there are actually no main male characters, and it was because it was set at a girls' boarding school, and I specifically wanted to tell a story about, you know, young women dealing, 13-year-old girls dealing with the challenges of being at a high-pressure um, school, um, you know, where potentially they're going to go off and do amazing things. Um, and I mean, this was, this book had a very small print run, you know, it's, it's not like it gained a wide readership, but I was sort of interested in the, the small response that I got to it, where people were basically like, what did you mean by having this book be all girls? Like, what was your agenda? And I was like, I, like, I just wanted to tell a story that was all girls, and it's like we have so many stories that are all guys, and nobody I mean, comes up to I the mean, writers of those stories and, be, and asks, what is your agenda, you know? Yeah, what was Tolkien's agenda in The Hobbit, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly, <laughs> right? Yeah. Where to start? <laughs> we could get into The Hobbit, but we're not. Yeah, I mean, I think, to. like, my, I don't, I didn't have any particular reason, but I always thought of Lucy and Andy as, as a brother and sister. I mean, I have two older brothers, and that, like, it seemed like it, that sounded, sounds boring to me, like writing about, like, three Neanderthal brothers. Like, that's <laughs> <I'm> so <laughs> uninteresting. It's like, I've lived that. I don't well, <laughs> want to. You know, it's funny, because I was putting, I was researching something else, and, uh, it was somebody's book, and it was about a, a boy who goes off and has an adventure. And I was almost going to write this joke and say, wow, finally we're going to see a boy <laughs> do fun things. Because it does seem like now it's like there's so many amazing. I know Hope is doing a book also for uh, Boom Studios, uh, Goldie mm -hmm. Vance, and, Vance. Uh, you know, Lumberjanes, and I mean, in comics especially. I mean, would, I mean, and thank God, I really don't mean that there should be, you know, we need to go back to boy stories. Um, <laughs> but I mean, it is like all the cool comics are about girls. So it's almost like, oh, Andy, good for Andy. Go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. well, I mean, I think that's one of the things that's really great about comics right now is that there are, there's so much more diversity in creators. And I think part of why I think it's important to have those other female characters or whatever it is, is to show, to increase your audience so that there's other people seeing that like, oh, that, that is relevant to me and so maybe someday, you know, they'll be growing up to draw comics too and um, just eventually everything will kind of balance out maybe. But. Yeah, like just from personal experience, like the first comic, like I, um, I didn't have a lot of access to comics when I was a kid, so it was like, I'm Canadian, so I read like Tintin and Asterix, which is a very popular comics in Canada. I know they're not super popular here in the States, but um, every Canadian library has Tintin and Asterix. But then it was like, I didn't read comics for the longest time, and then when I was like 21, I found Bone by Jeff Smith, and it was like, my eyes were open to what comics could be, and like, it was a very important creator to me, because it was like, it was, it was finally like someone made a comic for me. You know, it was action and adventure, and it had these great female characters in it, and this, just this wonderful world, and it was drawn, and, and I feel like this is also very key, it was drawn in a way that was very accessible, accessible to me as like a younger female reader. 
um, and actually like met him in 2012 at TCAF and like cried in front of him. <laughs> it was very embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> he still talks to me, which t much to my <laughs> surprise, but yeah. Well, that's a good, I was going to ask you who was uh, some of your, you know, favorite books that you had, you know, um, and I mean, Rebecca, were there, were there illustrators that really inspired you or, you know, kids books that you were like? Kids books. Yeah. Uh, I had, there was a lot of illustrated stories, not comics that had a strong influence on me. Um, I had a lot, I would find every single version of the illustrated version of The Secret Garden, like any any edition that had new illustrations in it, I would find. Because um, I just loved, I loved that type of story. It was so much about the place itself and it wasn't just Mary, it was like about that garden and how it changed. Um, and then I'm like Mrs. Rumpheus was a really good <laughs> children's book. It was always, it was like about the landscape and the ships and everything. Um, but I, I read a lot of comics too. I had a, a lot of manga as well. Mm. A lot. What kind of manga? <laughs> what were some of the manga you really loved? Um, uh, I was really into Bleach, um, uh, Subasa Reservoir Chronicle, mm -hmm. mm. Uh, anything by Clamp. Um, yeah. Uh, there's too many to name. Jeffrey, how about you? Who was some of your, like, is there someone that you think that you might, you know, be, like, influenced you? with how you tell your stories? Um, I mean, uh, there's, I think everything influences to some degree, even like stuff that I don't particularly like or think is very good, I think has, has the ability to influence because you know what you don't want to do. <laughs> um, I mean, one, one kid's book that I always go back to is um, this book called Small in the Saddle by M Mark Allen Stamati. And it's no longer in print, but he has another book called Who Needs Donuts that's um, still in print. And it's just crazy, weird details. Um, and I don't know. I mean, I grew up with like X-Men and um, Marvel Comics. Um, Star Wars was actually an influence in terms of art for me just because uh, there's all these, all the storyboard art and the concept art um, was kind of like this weird realization that like oh there's there's art that goes into making this other mm. stuff um like i don't i didn't have any interest in filmmaking but um like drawing concept art seemed like oh maybe that would be fun to do um <laughs> and so it's more inspiring in a general creative sense i guess yeah what, what um, about what about um what about storytellers though you know i mean like that, people beyond comics? Yeah. Or? No, do you have co in comics? I mean, like, you know, the thing about Bone that I think people really respond to is not only that Jeff's art is so great, but, you know, it's the story. Mm -hmm. You know, it's really such a, it, it's so resonant. And it's the words and the story. But, um, you, you know, I mean, it's a storyteller. I mean, The Secret Garden, that's a good one. I, I love that one, too. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, any, yeah. any period, like, story about a young girl, sort of like turn of the century, Anne of Green Gables? And she's got to find the secret. There's a, se you know, if there's exactly. a secret. The girl secret is, go if there's a garden, that secret. That girl's going to go into that garden. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it, it all ties, yeah. Girls having secrets, like girls cross-dressing as well, and sort of like hiding their gender. It's like, that's all about secret keeping as well. Yeah, that's true. Um, Faith, anyone for you? Any, any authors that are, you, um, know, you really? I mean, should I just stick with comics? No, you can, whoever, okay. yeah. Um, well, I'll stick with comics. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I mean, in terms of like storytelling and, and like drawing, how, how to storytell in comics, I'm, I'm very influenced by the Japanese creator, uh, comic, or cartoonist, uh, Noki Arasawa. Um, he actually does comics for adults. Um, and he's had a number of his works published in English, uh, Monster, Pluto, and 20th Century Boys, and now Viz is also, Viz, the publisher, is also publishing Master Keaton. Um, of the four of those, I would recommend Pluto. It's amazing, it's science fiction. Um, and I found his work, his work was like the, the first manga I read before I, before I started reading his work. I was like, uh, I don't really know about manga, you know, like it, I, it was my gateway, basically. And I remember looking at the way that he composed his pages and told his stories, and it was like, all the things that I was trying to do in my own work were suddenly apparent on the page in front of me. Like he has a way of like compressing and decompressing scenes that is really influential in my own work. Like I, I really believe in allowing emotion to 
um, breathe on the page and allowing characters time to act um, like as, as human beings. Um, I feel like my main complaint with uh, some, some superhero comics is that they are very, very, um, there's a lot of talking and not a lot of acting. So you'll get like static panels where uh, characters stand and they say things that seem emotional, but the characters are just like standing there, maybe gesturing. Um, and I really like seeing emotion drawn out on the page, yeah. uh, but not drawn out to the point where it is boring. Well, he's or, the best yeah. at pacing. Yes, he is. Just, like, he, he's considered the master of yeah, suspense he in really Japan. Is the best. Um, and yeah, he's yeah. So he's been a huge influence on my work. Um, as for Nameless City, um, I grew up reading the Perdain Chronicles by Lloyd Alexander, classics of children liter children's literature, and I highly recommend them for wonderful fantasy worlds where. Um, there are dark themes, but then there are themes alongside lighter themes and comedy, and that's something that's very important to me. Um, I don't ever want to have someone read one of my books and not find a moment humorous. Like, I, I, I do feel like humor is very important in a story, uh, as important as uh, deeper or darker themes in a work. Yeah. Mm. Rebecca, are you, are you, do you feel like you're going to stick with stuff for for younger readers, or do you want to do adult stuff, or? Um, I like all ages comics. I definitely like the idea of writing stories that are accessible to both older readers and kids, um, because that was the, always the type of stories that I was uh, most drawn to, because I, I like the idea of sort of preserving um, uh, a space where everybody can like emotionally connect with the story. Um, but. I think it's, if I was going to go for any uh, more adult themes, it would only be in personal work. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Well, for now, anyway. You're <laughs> just starting out. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> it's your first book. Um, do, I, I, if we have questions, if anybody has any questions for the, for the crew here, uh, yeah. yeah. There's a mic if you want to use it, but you could sit there too. Yeah. I can hear you. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, I'm so excited. Like, I don't know. I mean, I, I feel like so much is being published now. And I, I feel like I've had this conversation with like a bunch of people at this convention where it's like, I'm so excited about comics, but as an adult, like I, I'm seeing these, these all ages comics come out and I, and I love them and they're amazing. And I'm a little sad for like 10 year old me that she didn't get to read them as well. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm really excited by comics. I'm excited by what's being made in animation. Um, I feel like movies are kind of lagging behind. Uh, I saw Kubo and the Two Strings. I, th I thought that movie was great. Um, and it was a kid's movie that dealt with some very dark themes, but did it in a way that was very human and very wonderful. Um, yeah, it's, it's awesome. <laughs> Definitely. This is the golden age of comics that we're living in right now. Yeah, I mean, um, like my older son is nine, and like there's so much stuff, more stuff that's perfect for him to choose from than than when I was his age. Like I had Marvel Comics, that was it, and um, yeah, it's great. Does he read your comics? Yeah. <laughs> so he says they're the best. You know, somebody was. Telling, I believe him. Somebody <laughs> last night, the best critic, was telling me the opposite. They were saying like she, it was a woman. I forget who it is. It'll come to me, but she, I won't say, because she said she gave her kid her comics and was like, mm. <laughs> Mom, it's a little boring. So I was like, Whoa, harsh audience. <laughs> Burn. Yeah. Any any other questions out there? Yeah. Anything? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay, and over there too. Yeah, go, you go and then, yeah. Uh, go for it, dude. I'm more familiar or cynical about the gender flipping and uh, the more recent superhero uh, Marvel stuff and things like that, like uh, Spider Gwen. Most of the gender flipping has been from a male character to a female character. That's, uh, so yes. Mm -hmm. It's about time. <laughs> yeah. 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 They're welcome to do that more, like way more. That would be great. Thanks. 
But you know, <laughs> but, but you know, just to, to, to I'm going to just jump in here. I mean, this goes back to the oldest parts of superheroes. You know, first there was Batman, and then very soon there was Robin, and they, you know, Batwoman came super. There was Superman, there was Superboy, the Supergirl. I mean, there was the Captain Marvel and the Marvel family. I mean, they loved spinning them all off, you know, <laughs> like throw another costume on them. So, you know, it's not, it's not new at all, so... Yeah. But um, yeah, we had some over there. Yeah. Um, yeah, and this is kind of a big question for you, Faith. Mm-hmm. Um, but of course, any of you can weigh in. But I was just wondering uh, how you balance like writing and drawing, because that just like kind of seems overwhelming sometimes. And like I love your work, Faith. Oh, thank you. Seems like you've always done that really well. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Gosh, I, I mean, I feel like I, I'm different from Rebecca, where I tend to prefer to write and draw my own stories. I have worked with um, writers, and I, I've, I've drawn their stories. And um, not to say that my experiences have been unpleasant, or but I always feel like maybe I'm a little less into those stories than my own. Um, but I feel like that's a personality thing, maybe. Um, I actually came to drawing fairly late. Um, I started making comics when I was in my late teens, early 20s, and that's kind of late, you know? Like, I, I come to SPX and I meet, like, 12-year-olds who are amazing <laughs> at comics, you know? Like, and, and I don't know, like, I, I feel like I, and I didn't really draw before that point. Like, I drew horses. I was super into horses. So I would only draw horses. Um, and then started making comics when, when I was in college, and um, I feel like the writing part has always been a little easier for me. Um, and the, the drawing part is very challenging. Like, I work very hard to become, I, I have worked very hard to become a halfway decent artist, and I still struggle with art. Um, but as for, like, just sitting down and doing it, it's like, I write the script, and then I draw the script. And, um, I, I, yeah, I feel like if, if you're an artist, and you're, you feel comfortable drawing, and you want to get into writing, but you maybe feel like um, you don't quite have the skills to do that, you can learn it. Like, writing is a skill just as much as drawing is. And if you've been able to learn to draw, I feel like you can learn to write as well. Um, so yeah, it's just you know putting one foot in front of the other, and writing one page after the other, and then drawing one page after the other. <laughs> yeah. I mean, actually, um, Hope Larson, uh, the author of Compass South, I mean, uh, I met her back in the day here, like 12 years ago, when yeah. she was, um, she drew her comics then too, and she's kind of moved into writing now, so. Right. I think it's good to do both. Like, um, just speaking purely, purely from a career point of view, um, I, I feel very lucky that I've been able to do both, and I've been able to also write for other artists, and, and they've, been, they've drawn my scripts. Um, I think it's also maybe a little bit easier to make a, a living in comics if you can do both. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Jeffrey, would you ever think of writing for other artists? Um, I, you know, I think about it, but my problem is, is that so much of my writing I do in my head, so it's almost like it's so, it would be so much work to write it out for someone else to do, <laughs> that it was like, I might as well just do it myself. Um, <laughs> so I, I, I think about it sometimes, but, um, and maybe they'll be the right project. I have like a couple projects that, that I think, like I might get to that point, but and then it's just a matter of finding the time yeah. to do that. But. I mean, one of the <laughs> okay, one of the coolest things about being a writer and writing a script that you do not have to draw is sometimes you will write something like a giant army attacks another giant army, <laughs> and it will take you ten seconds to write that down, and it will take the artist like two days to draw it. And you're like, yeah. For the and next six yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hope will write in, sorry, Rebecca, <laughs> under some of the panels that she has written for me. Yeah. It's like pages 32 through 48, battle yeah. scene. Yeah. <laughs> just, just make it up as you go along. I'm sure you know what to do, right? Yeah. Uh, it, that's, I mean, some of, some of it is fun. It's just like, oh, god damn it. <laughs> but it's like when you, get, when you figure it out, you're like, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Was there any pages that were, was there any scenes that were really daunting for you when you were drawing, drawing it? Like when you first read it, and you're like, oh, snap. Yeah, there was a whole scene in the jungle um, with, a, with a giant cat. 
<laughs> and they were running away from it. And then they were they like turned the tables, and then they were trying to catch it. And that was all really difficult for me to visualize. There, I, I guess because there were no like flat walls and corners for me to deal with, and also like having to draw a cat. I had to learn how to draw cats. <laughs> um, and then you know make it interesting. <laughs> it's yeah. a lot of levels. There are any uh, more questions out there? I thought I saw another hand. Yeah, you know, uh, we'll go back there and then I'll probably, uh, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> um, we've seen sort of a mix of uh, black and white pages and color pages, and I was wondering if you could comment on the impact of color, particularly in how children react to it, because I, I think of children as being people who sort of react to bright colors. And we all do. Yeah. <laughs> I love color. <laughs> The, the more colorful, the better. Yeah, kids get mad at me about Jedi Academy not being in color. <laughs> but um, I mean, for me, just the way I work, um, I wouldn't. I'd probably still be working on the first Jedi Academy because I'm, I'm too controlling to let someone else color color it. And same. It was just um, so the Vader books are a little easier to. Uh, to do full color because they're shorter, but um, yeah, maybe someday I'll do a, a full color book like that, but um, it's just the, the time constraint, and then also just with both Scholastic and Random House for, for Jedi Academy and Lucy Andy, it just becomes a cost issue where it's, it's a lot cheaper to print black and white still, so. Well, the uh, next, oh, I'm sorry, go on. Oh, no, I was just going to say, um, so I did um, a book, Friends with Boys, which was YA, and initially when First Second bought that book, they wanted it to be in color, and I was very resistant to it because I was like a black and white nerd, and all of my, um, some of my previous books had been black and white, um, and eventually they decided that because it was a teen book with a teen audience in mind, uh, it was okay for it to be black and white because teens are used to drawing, or sorry, used to reading black and white books. Um, with Nameless City, I knew this was going to be middle grade. Um, I really wanted it to be bright looking. I wanted it to look like a cartoon. Um, one of the influences for that book was Avatar of Last Airbender, one of my favorite shows. So I hired a colorist, Jordi Belair. Uh, she works out of Ireland. She's friggin' amazing. And um, she, I paid her a big chunk of money to color that book, and she did an amazing job, and she did it so much faster. Like, she colored, okay, so the, she works with a flatter, so that's someone that goes in and does, like, all the flat colors, and then she goes in and adjusts it, and, sorry, this is, like, technical language, and, like, adds <laughs> magic to it, basically. Mm -hmm. And um, she colored the second Nameless City book in, like, two weeks, and it's, like, a 230-page <laughs> book. So she is amazing, and it's her job. Like, she's won two eyes, no, there's no words yeah, she, she, as a colorist. Yeah, she's amazing. She yeah, colors she's a ton incredible. of books for Marvel and, and on DC. I mean, she's like the top. Yeah, top, she colors top. everything, and she's she's awesome. Um, so I'm very, very thrilled to work with her. Uh, for me, like, I don't have a good handle on color. I'm not like Rebecca, um, where I don't have a good I don't have a good color sense. No, trust me. I I'm just I'm so bad at color. And with Nameless City, it was like we talked about what the book would look like, and I was like very firm, I was like, this is a multi-ethnic world, you know, no white people, um, this is, you know, <laughs> a, you know a, a city based on, on 13th century China with a very diverse population, and uh, so we went back and forth on the look of the book, and then I basically let her work her magic. I did not feel like I wanted to give her a lot of input. Um, I wanted her to go and be an artist and create. So pretty much everything you see in the book is her vision and her idea with uh, my direction. Um, but yeah, she's awesome, and I love, I love working in color with her. Rebecca, did you color your book? Or? I did. It wasn't the plan to color my, for me to color my book. We hired two other colorists before we landed on me <laughs> um, because the first, the first one got sick and couldn't do the book, and then the second one, they sent in the first chapter, and I wasn't happy with it um, because I had a very clear idea of how I wanted the color to look. I just didn't think I had time to do it myself. Um, so, and in the end, my control, um, my my need to control everything overtook me. Did it take you two weeks or longer? <laughs> two and a half months. I had never <laughs> oh, colored well that's, that's a book speedy. before either, so yeah. I I had to go overcome a lot of hurdles, including. Um, asking all of my friends and family to flat it for me because I couldn't uh, afford hiring a flatter. Yeah. My mother flatted 30 pages of this book. Wow. She's really good. <laughs> and I feel like that's, you know, it's like 
if you work with a colorist, that's your collaborator, right? And I've had bad experiences with colorists. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it has to be the right fit. I, there was one project where the guy just would not listen to me, and eventually I went, to, it was this very small project, and it was like, eventually I had to go to the editor and I say, I, I just, this isn't working out, you know? He's not, he's not doing what I feel like he should be doing, so we got a different colorist. Um, but yeah, like this is, colorists are crucial and they are important, and I feel like they can really shape the narrative of a book. Yeah, one more question out there, and then we're just about out of time. So, yeah, you know what? I'm gonna, yeah, yeah, you. <laughs> uh, so, when you guys, like, um, get to the darker moments in uh, comic books and illustrating, like, how do you, um, how do you, like, illustrate that darker moment? Like, how do you, like, change the characters' lighting or what type of thing? Sorry, do you mean, how like, do you darker as in, like, at nighttime, or do you mean, like, emotionally darker? Emotionally darker. Um, I guess it depends on the type of moment, but um, I think you do need to give that moment space and wait. Um, if it's like a revelation of some kind or, or like tension, um, like you were saying, like timing and, and pacing in the way that you, you space your, your panels and in the, in the way that you lay out your page like makes a big difference for the emotional impact of something. Yeah. You had a, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I was just going to say, uh, when it comes to writing for all ages, like that's a big, broad audience. So what do you do when you're coming up with like a concept that's maybe not appropriate for some younger ages that older will understand, or maybe something where like you kind of have to simplify it for younger, and then older kind of starts to lose traction? Or like whenever you're writing for a specific age group, but then a total different age group comes and takes the, the theme yeah. I mean, I, I feel like maybe all ages is like a misleading term yeah. because it's like yeah. I like I made Nameless City for kids, but I've 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 gotten feedback that adults enjoy it. I feel like it's sophisticated enough for older readers, but the main characters are kids, right? Um, and I, and I feel like that's a key too. Like not always, but I, I do feel like for the most part, if you're doing fiction for kids, the main characters should be kids rather than like. 30-year-old people, <laughs> you know, I don't know. Like that, and, and I mean, I know that's not, you know, how it is with everything, but generally that's, that's the rule. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, yeah, like I, I feel like all, like I look at Bone, you know, and Bone is, is like all ages, but I mean, I know, I'm pretty sure I've heard Jeff Smith talk in interviews about how he, he was trying to make comics for kids and then other people enjoyed it because it was so sophisticated. It was, you know, sophisticated comics for kids. So, I don't know, I mean, I, I feel like maybe you should target towards one particular reader, and then um, hopefully you have created a work that is so good that every reader will enjoy it. Uh, I mean, I mean I, sorry, go on. Oh, I, sorry, yeah, I always, I just always try to like put in some kind of jokes that, that I know kids won't get, but that adults will. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so I just t try to sprinkle sprinkle other levels of meaning and humor um, within the story so that, you know, you're not going to lose anything from the story if you don't get that, but if you're an older reader, then maybe you understand it on a, like in a different way. Yeah. Well, I think we're out of time, so um, I want to thank you all for coming, and please go check out all the work of Jeffrey, Rebecca, and Aaron. Thank you so much for coming. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>